Hello and welcome to the Daily News Simplified, one stop solution for current affairs where we take up three newspapers, the Hindu Indian Express and the Hindu Business Line every day. We usually go live at 6 in the evening, but it's just for today that we are going live at 5 in the evening. And the reason why we had to prepone this session is because uh, our long term colleague and now a faculty of history at Rao's IA Study Circle, Mr. Jatin Bharadwaj, is getting married today. And all the team members want to attend this uh, auspicious ceremony. And that's why we wanted to get free early from the office work so that we can go and attend that marriage. So that's why only for today, we are going live at 5 in the evening. So today is 12th of February and the articles that we have identified today are uh, four articles from the perspective of prelims examination. As you can see in the business line, there is a term which has appeared uh, with respect to the misuse of a particular scheme of the government of India by Bandhan Bank and that term is called evergreening of loans. Brumation, very very important term in the environment static portion uh, which is a, like a kind of a dormancy and so we are going to take that up. Voluntary carbon market is a new kind of an initiative uh, which has been started initiated by Bureau of Energy Efficiency. We are going to look into that. And the copper demand in India has shot up in last two to three years. There are certain reasons why the demand for copper has shot. And utilizing this article as an anchor, we are going to cover some static about copper. As you all of us know, if you are following the current affairs, that the results of elections in Pakistan have somewhat been concluded and it looks like that Prime Minister Imran Khan's supported independent candidates because his party and his election symbol uh, was banned in Pakistan and so all most of the winners majority of the winners belong to the independent candidate which was supported by Imran Khan now that creates a complex situation in Pakistan where for the first time it looks like that the candidates and the party supported by the deep state mainly the army has not been able to gain the majority and that creates a perplexing situation for India so we are going to look into uh, India and Pakistan relations there is another news article in the business line which talks about uh, which is an interview of I am Ahmedabad's director and his view on foreign universities as far as editorial summary is concerned we are going to look into three very very important articles one of them has appeared in The Hindu which talks about women representation in politics, increasing closeness between India and EU, uh, UAE in The Hindu and in the Indian Express the article talks about the India's capability to act as a net security provider securing the sea lanes. So let's now begin the discussion. Before we begin we have an announcement that Rao's IS is conducting all India free uh, mock test. It is going to be a series of three uh, tests. First of that uh, will be organized on 17th on 18th of February. There is a link in the description of the video where you can register. You just have to log in on eLearn and you can take the test online as well as you can appear at our centers in Delhi and Bangalore in an offline if you really want the exam like simulation. All right. Before we begin the discussion, it's a very, very humble request for all of you to all of you to please press the like button and let us know what you feel about our initiatives. Let's now begin with the voluntary carbon market. This has, as you can see, this is a screenshot of the article from the business line. The promise of voluntary carbon market. Carbon market has acted as a key mechanism for climate change mitigation. What does mitigation mean? Mitigation means reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that are being emitted into the atmosphere. So how do you do that? You do that by cleaning the industrial processes, by cleaning the vehicular emissions. And that's why the government has brought up a stricter emission norms graduating from BS3 to BS4 and skipping the BS5 altogether to reach to BS6, which are very, very uh, tough and stringent to say the least. Now, in this regard, one of the initiatives that was taken uh, was about the carbon credit trading scheme. Carbon credit is like a virtual credit that you get into your account once you fulfill the obligations of emissions that was imposed upon you. Let me just take two minutes to make it understand to you as to how carbon credits work. So if this is a company A and let's say in 2020, this is the emissions that company A was doing. Government knows that this kind of emission is unsustainable and a cap is put on them that within five years, 
they have to bring down their emissions to this level right so let's say in 2020 this is the emission of a company a at the same time there was a company b which was emitting in 2020 20 another amount of carbon emissions greenhouse gas emissions and another level of cap was put that made it binding on them to meet that target which means that they have to do anything and everything possible to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions five years down the line the targets that were given to a company a company a was able to do more than what was given as a target so let's say if this was the target that they have to reduce the by this much amount they were actually they actually managed to reduce their carbon emissions beyond that what you do beyond that becomes your credit at the same time a company b while the target was this much reduction it was not being carried out by company b but because now it is a legal obligation for them they have to show it in their accounts now how the carbon markets work is that if you are not able to meet their your own obligations you can purchase it or you can pay for the actions that someone else has taken and you can borrow those credits for someone else who has done more than what was expected so a person who has done less than expected can pay for and buy those from a person who has done more than what was expected of that person why this is in news is because earlier it was the exchange of carbon credits was applicable only among and between those firms which had mandatory targets to achieve so if i am beyond the mandatory target scheme if there is no obligation on me i was not allowed to trade even if i am cleaning my process even if i am taking all the measures to mitigate and reduce the carbon signatures that my particular establishment is generating what the amendments yesterday have done is that if there is a firm which is under no obligation to carry out these reforms if they are able to reduce the carbon credits then they can trade it even beyond uh, what was expected of them as you can see carbon credit and carbon markets have already been tested in as latest as 2023 prelims so what to remember compliance mechanism involves mandatory implementation among obligated entities only those entities for which it is obligatory Voluntary markets are driven by businesses uh, seeking to decrease their carbon footprint including by offsetting greenhouse gas under the amended scheme non obligated entities the entities on which the government did not mandate any kind of reduction can voluntarily register projects in sectors identified by national steering committee for securing tradable carbon credits so if i am a firm on which there was no obligation to reduce the carbon credit i can now take actions and those actions can be monetized uh, by that particular firm let's try and understand let's try and know whether we understood it or not which of the following statement is our correct regarding carbon credit trading scheme it takes into account the mandatory implementation for the obligated entities but excludes voluntary markets this is wrong because now it also includes the voluntary markets it allows indian companies to trade carbon credit certificates in domestic as well as foreign markets this is also incorrect and that's why the statement because now the carbon credit trading is not allowed between indian firms and foreign firms so the demand and supply of carbon credits has to be done the matching has to be done within the borders of india it is not allowed so right answer is d neither one nor two next news deals with copper because the uh, yes copper demand may see double digit growth in 2024 this is again an article which has been taken from the business line this article talks about how uh, the demand for copper across the globe is dismally low if this is 5% this is 10% this is 15% at it is growing at the level of 3% globally whereas in the case of india as latest as 2022 the demand growth the growth in demand has been in the range of around 16% and the reasons behind such a sharp demand of copper is india's initiatives to invest in electric vehicles uh, in the technological sector because copper being malleable ductile as well as conductive it is a good conductor 
of both heat as well as electricity is required in solar panels is required in ev it is required in chips it is required everywhere because india is now investing in manufacturing it is investing in greening it is investing in electric vehicles the demand has suddenly shot up so you can see that questions related to copper have already been asked in 2021 prelims and that's why we have decided to tell you that the possible increase in growth of coppers emanates from investment in infrastructure evs and clean tech per capita copper usage in india is still very low it is around 1 kg per person as uh, at the same time in on the other hand globally it is the average is around 3.2 kgs per person copper is malleable and it is ductile that is an excellent conductor of heat as well as electricity and that's why it is a way much more sought after metal apart from that it is found solely in igneous as well as in metamorphic rocks uh, it is usually found in generally found in very very simple compounds and that's why it is the first metal that came to be utilized by humans because for other metals they normally in nature they exist in complex compound forms and so human society has to evolve the technologies to be able to separate the compound of nature and isolate just the metal part whereas it is sim it is very simple to uh, purify and get the copper out of the igneous as well as metamorphic rocks with reference to copper consider the following statements hematite and magnetite are ores of copper if you remember even a little bit of chemistry from your class 10 level you know that these are the ores of iron and not copper khetri and hazari bagh are known for copper mining this is correct because if you look at the distribution of copper in india you will understand that this is the area in rajasthan which is khetri and this is the area in jharkhand hazari bagh plato the per capita copper usage in india is at par to the global average this is also incorrect because you can see this the overall consumption of copper per capita is way lower than the global averages leading us to the right answer only one let's now move on to the next important article from the perspective of prelims examination and that is called brumation why we have taken this article because if you go to the last page of today's the hindu science page it contains this article brumation winter is coming for reptiles so reptiles being a cold blooded animal cold blooded means that they do not have thermoregulation they do they do not have the capacity of homeostasis so for example most of the homo sapiens which means us human beings have the capability the body has the mechanism to maintain a static temperature right so for example for us it is anywhere between 36 to 37 degrees celsius it can vary from race to race person to person but in one degree celsius range entire homo sapiens operate and when we are not able to maintain that temperature we pass out we are basically dead that's why when we go out in winter we have to wear clothes to help our body to maintain and retain that temperature between a very close range because all the mechanisms biochemical reactions in our body are so adapted to be best efficient at that particular temperature whereas this mechanism is not available with every species so for example what uh, in case of brumation is a hibernation estivation all these are different kinds of dormancies dormancy as a word itself tells you being dormant which means that while the period you are dormant your body's mechanisms will not operate optimally they will not operate at a level that is best suited for you to perform so your body's processes your reactions biochemical reactions release of hormones and enzymes will drastically slow down it is observed not just in uh, reptiles which do not have thermoregulation but it is also observed in mammals for example polar bears uh, decide to sleep off six months because it's so cold that it is better for them to slow down their activities to save the energy for uh, as long as you have winters so when it comes to brumation it is a peculiar wait a second yes okay so brumation is a
is this visible yes so brumation is again the slowing down of uh, activities but it is a particular term which is kept reserved for reptiles only so when reptiles are not able to operate efficiently then uh, the phenomena that we attribute or the term that has been designed for them is called brumation so it is typically observed in for example alligators lizards and it is a very specific term which is observed in reptiles during colder periods where the temperatures are very low now the temperature outside is very low and these species do not have capability to maintain or retain their temperature so what do they do they, they dug the burrows they dig the burrows and they go deep inside the surface of the earth where the conditions are relatively warmer than what exists at the surface level because at the surface level being in contact with atmosphere it is colder but that cold does not travel down three to five feet down where it, the situations are still a little bit more uh, warmer and so they do that to go farther away from cold and basically they switch off their body for as long as there are winters when they understand their bodily mechanisms understand that winter has gone they come out of those burrows to enjoy the spring uh, hibernation is a term which is given or attributed to warm blooded animals or endotherms the species or animals which have the capability to maintain a particular body temperature so what they do uh, they generally there is an alteration of heart rate so the rate at which heart beats slows down uh, obviously metabolism goes down because during very very cold months there is going obviously going to be the scarcity of food and so because you are not going to get food you cannot digest and process the food faster so you slow down your activities you really don't move because you will not have the energy to support your day-to-day -day functioning and so basically everything uh, slows down at the same time estivation is almost the same phenomena but it is not observed in cold but it is observed in hot plus uh, arid or dry situations right so when the situations are very hot and when the situations are very dry uh, it is generally observed and again it is observed in cold-blooded like reptiles or ectotherms so you can see that body has to respond to what is happening in the surrounding and how does it responds depends upon whether it is a cold blooded or a warm blooded animal the name changes depending upon what is the kind of external factor so while brumation and hibernation is a response to the cold situation estivation is a response to hot and arid climate like a drought Whereas brumation and estivation is observed in cold-blooded animals, hibernation is observed in warm-blooded. So if you remember this distinction, it is easier for you to uh, memorize things because that these can be directly tested in the prelims examination. Let's now move on to the last article for the prelims discussion that is evergreening of loans. Forensic, forensic audit opened into Bandhan Bank's evergreening of loans. How does this ever what is evergreening evergreening of loans basically means that a loan so for example if this is a lender like a financial institution or a bank that extend some amount of loan to a particular entity a in response that particular entity a is not able to pay back the loan in a timely manner and it is there is a likelihood of default or that particular asset being declared a non-performing asset or an npa uh, a as an entity might can try to convince the lender that look my business cycle is going through the rough times so if you just extend me a little bit more loan maybe i will survive i will do well in business and so not only i will return or repay back the new loan but obviously my increased business activity is going to take care of the previous loan that right now i am not able to pay back that is called evergreening now uh, what happens is that the government from time to time in order to ensure that the loans and uh, the debt 
uh, is being issued to the needy firms especially belonging to micro small and medium msme sector comes up with various kinds of schemes so for example priority sector lending is one kind of an initiative where government makes it mandatory for the banks to lend out 40% of all loans to a particular set of sectors like agriculture like education loan like msme this is one type of initiative another type of initiative is that what government says that we understand that extending loan to a micro sector or a small sector is a risky affair for a bank if given an option they would always want to lend to tatas and ambanis and adanis because knowing that these are the big corporate firms likelihood of default is very low because likelihood of them not doing well in business is low and even if they are not able to do businesses they have hundreds of other sources of profit from which they are going to pay it back which is not the case with micro small and medium enterprises now in if the government wants them wants these small firms to get assured loan from the uh, commercial and other kinds of so uh, lending institutions the government has to provide some incentive to the lenders some incentive to the banks so what government has done is as it has created a kind of a credit guarantee scheme multiple types of credit guarantee schemes exist you can look at the pdf you can download it and you will uh, see that there are so many like at least 20 credit guarantee scheme being run by the government of india where the government says that in notified sectors and to selected firms if a particular lender chooses to give certain amount of loan then a percentage of that will be insured what does that mean? That means that in case the borrower is not able to pay back, certain percentage of the loan shall be directly given by the government to the lender. So if let's say a lender has given 1 crore loan to this particular micro sector industry, uh, small scale industry A. Now if A is not able to pay back 1 crore loan, then in that case what the government will say don't worry this particular sector comes under 25 percent rebate we are going to give you the bank 20 to 25 lakhs so that is that minimizes or that reduces the risk where uh, for the lender now in this particular case although the investigations are still to be conducted they are still to be held but what it looks like is that the bandhan bank has misused the provisions of the various kinds of credit guarantee schemes so what they have done they have categorized a lot of loans under the scheme where the firms were not eligible to begin with as a beneficiary of this particular scheme in a lot of cases it looks like that they have uh, given out secondary loans which is what evergreening means under this particular scheme where to begin with the primary loan or the fresh loan the first loan that was extended was not uh, extended under the credit guarantee scheme so what we can do is that we can simply understand this term and understand ba basically this corporation which has been incorporated under the companies act and it acts as a common trustee company for multiple credit guarantee funds so government has created a fund and that fund will fund all the lenders where there is a likelihood or there is a default to act as an insurer you go ahead you give out the loan if it defaults certain percentage we are here to reimburse to you and so what is evergreening it means throwing new loans to help a stressed or a delinquent borrower to repay the old loans which of the following best describes the concept of evergreening of loans obviously the right answer would be throwing new loans to help a stressed or a delinquent borrower to repay the old loans all right okay so let's now begin and uh do the two articles from the perspective of mains examination the two articles that you see one has been picked from the hindu pakistan's democratic revolution with seam and swing why uh, mr akbar zaidi is calling uh, the election results as revolution that i have already talked in the introduction it is a revolution because for the first time it looks like that a political party has defeated the most powerful institution in the Pakistan which is the army because virtually it was not a fight between Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and ex-Prime Minister Imran Khan it was for all practical purposes a battle between 
पाकिस्तान तहरीक इंसाफ पी टी आई वर्सेज दी आर्मी आर्मी वॉज ओपनली सपोर्टिंग द अदर पार्टीज लाइक नवाज शरीफ पार्टी विच इज पी एम एल एंड दे हैव डिफीटेड ऑल दे हैव बेट ऑल द गॉन अगेंस्ट ऑल द ऑर्ड्स टू विन नॉट ओनली द प्राइम एक्स प्राइम मिनिस्टर नवाज इमरान खान इज अंडर डिटेंशन फॉर अ वेरी लॉन्ग टाइम हिज पार्टी वॉज डिबार्ड फ्रॉम कंटेस्टिंग इलेक्शंस all the election symbols were taken away from pti and so there was no other option for the imran khan's party but to support independent candidates and the independent candidates supported by imran khan have won they are in most numbers and this is what will likely enable them to form the government but obviously the army is going to intervene there uh then second article has been written by former diplomat mr vivek karju and it has appeared in the indian express and it talks about election without winner so there is no clear winner uh, obviously because the mandate looks like it is fractured it is fractured because the rest of the mps who have won on the backing of imran khan still remains to be seen whether they will be able to form a coalition because they do not belong to any particular party and to manage 200 people from uh, who are just independent candidates is going to be a difficult task why we are bothered about this is the lack of democracy in pakistan has been the single most important reason why we have not been able to store or bring normalcy into india's pakistan relation and being a democratic country india is subjected to a lot of restrictions and constraints when it comes to management of foreign affairs and you will see that whenever in a neighborhood a particular state goes through the process of military rule the relationship between india and that country sars which is not the case with china because being an authoritarian regime they have full freedom to operate in their foreign affairs india cannot openly engage with taliban it will be very difficult for a democratic nation with high credentials like india to interact with and that's the reason why our relationship with myanmar has again sars because the military junta has come back to power the same was the case when in sri lanka there was a dictatorship of rajapaksha brothers and so pakistan being controlled and driven by the pakistani army has always created problems for india it has created problems for india since the beginning of or the genesis or the creation of pakistan in 1948 because if you trace the relationship between india and pakistan from 1947 and 1948 you can divide it into mainly three phases to 1947 to 2001 and that phase can be categorized as a phase of active aggression why do we call it active aggression because in this particular phase india fought three main wars and a one battle three main wars to begin with 1947 war then we had 1962 war and then we had 1971 war and finally we had kargil so it, you can say on an average there was a war every 13 to 14 years and out of those three wars were massive in their length and breadth obviously we have a history of partition partition following a lot of riots and violence killing of a lot of people communalism and that's what uh, actually laid the foundation of bad relation between india and pakistan following that three wars in between the lack of agreement on border especially the line of control has ruffled the feathers between india and pakistan because which will come to right now uh, in some moments from now both kashmir with respect to the differing perception about kashmir and the ground realities with respect to the claims on siachen glacier and sir creek has never allowed india and pakistan to transition into peaceful neighbors at the same time during the same period after 1995 both the countries performed nuclear tests to demonstrate their capabilities that not only they have developed the mechanism which will allow them to use the weapon they also have the delivery system by testing various missiles for example from india we test fired prithvi and agni from there they test fired shaheen both of them nuclear capable ballistic missiles which then uh, created a kind of arms race one bo once both these nations know that the other nation contains and has the capability to nuke the other that always creates problem 
towards the end of the Kargil war, that is towards the end of 2001, when we finished off with the Kargil and one year down the line, both the countries realized that, that this was a realization which was mutual, where the realization was that if we go on like this, we, uh, we are going to hamper the interests of both the nations and it is towards the both the nations advantage and benefit that they start talking, they start interacting, they start negotiating and that's why the next phase that we have between 2001 and 2008 can be called as a phase of reconciliation where this idea in both uh, on both the sides was to engage or re-engage. So that's why you will, uh, if you go back, search on the internet, not only the president of uh, Pakistan, Army General, uh, visited India, but Indian Prime Minister Vajpayee also went to Lahore and that was like a period where we restarted diplomatic engagement, we started cultural engagement. Uh, at the same time, Prime Minister Vajpayee gave the tagline of Insaniyat, which means humanism, uh, Zamhuriyat, which means democracy, and Kashmiriyat, which means the essence of Kashmiri people of living in harmony and that these three key words actually changed the political sentiment across both the sides of the borders because that showed the readiness of India to engage humanly, to engage in a democratic peaceful manner and to uh, espouse the cause or the thread which had bound the Kashmiri society since eternity where the Kashmiri Pandits as well as Muslims since medieval times had lived uh, peacefully coexisted. But all of it had to suddenly change because this coming together was not being liked by the Pakistani deep state. Because unlike other countries for which armies exist, a lot of scholars say that Pakistan as a state exists for Pakistani army, that is the other way around. Indian army exists to defend Indian nation, whereas the Pakistan exists for the survival of Pakistani army and then in 2008, you have Mumbai terror attacks and as soon as the Mumbai terror attacks happened, everything went back and since then, India-Pakistan relations have never, never been the same again. Because what followed was passive bilateralism, very low-key interactions, you, you cannot interact. In fact, at that point of time, the conversations were that uh, Indian army should hold solely attack. Pakistan to take the revenge. It was not done for various reasons. But then, since then, uh, when 2014, Mr. Prime Minister Narendra Modi took oath, he uh, uh, initiated neighborhood first policy. If you remember, in the first swearing in ceremony, all the leaders of SARC were invited to attend the meeting. But then, just the just one year down the line, you had multiple terror attacks. You had Pathan Court. Right, if you remember that, you have Nagrota and then you had Uri, which was revenged in the form of surgical strikes. And so, multiple terrorist attacks renewed the hostility between India and Pakistan. India not only uh, finished, ended all the uh, trade relations with Pakistan, so it becomes virtually, became virtually uh, impossible to directly export or import anything in between India and Pakistan. So, India uh, cancelled the most favoured nation status uh, to Pakistan, uh, which is an first obligation if you become a member of WTO. India utilised the internal security clause to remove Pakistan from there. And uh, you can see that from 2015 until 2023, nothing has happened. Nothing has happened in the direction which can normalise the ties. The reason, the question is, what makes peace elusive between India and Pakistan? What are the issues? So for example, this acrimony, this hatred between India and Pakistan is unlike the problems or troubles that you face between India and other nations. So for example, you will, have, you will always have divergences, differences when each country is pursuing their own national interest, which is what they are supposed to do. You will always have convergences. But then there are certain specific and particular reasons in case of India and Pakistan which makes this hostility kind of permanent. One of them and at the root of it is Kashmir conundrum. Kashmir as you can see 
right now in reality is this is pakistan occupied kashmir the territory which is claimed by india but then on the ground controlled by pakistan they got the position in 1947 war when we were not ready and they attacked and that uh, the cease fire line became the line of control this is uh, this area over here is a triangular piece of land which is siachen glacier and beneath that you have now what is called as union territory of jammu and kashmir and this is ladakh now pa according to pakistan kashmir belongs to them because they believe in two nation theory where the two main religions should have the two political state the nation should be based on religious identity that was the idea of jinnah and that's what they started that's why they started demanding of course that two nation theory got falsified the day bangladesh was created because bangladesh is also muslim majority country so if two nation theory could be the basis of organizing a political community in subcontinent then how can you have a separate territory for for the group of muslims but nonetheless for them it is an unfinished task and it is an unfinished agenda of the partition so they consider it as something that is incomplete for india kashmir is an integral part not only the part that we control on the ground level but also the pakistan occupied kashmir so after the 1971 war when we signed the shimla agreement it was agreed between the two countries that they are going to negotiate bilaterally through peaceful means but the results of 1970 war 1971 1972 the one year period when the bangladesh was created pakistan and the pakistani army realized that if they are going to fight against india symmetrically through traditional military warfare they will never be able to compete with india because of obviously the difference differential capabilities and it will be very very difficult for them to uh, defeat and if we want to take kashmir it is not possible militarily and that's when they resorted to asymmetric warfare asymmetric warfare means that you do not directly contest or fight on face to face what you do is that you bleed india through thousand cuts you identify the cleavages in india society so one cleavage exist in kashmir you fuel the elements which are anti india you if there is no insurgency which exists in the state of punjab but you know that there are certain religious groups which want an independent state of their own even though in minority you fund them and so through this became the official motto of the pakistani army that they wanted to bleed india through thousand cuts fund so many insurgencies train so many leaders in pakistani territory set up the camps so that it becomes impossible for india to fight at the same time there will always be an element of deniability india can never directly prove that these insurgency movements terror outfits they are operating from pakistan because pakistan will never accept it and pakistan will never allow entry to any foreign delegation to go back to the to go to the training camps it was very very late and it is very recently that the global community started sort of accepting the fact that pakistan has indeed fueled the radicalization islamization and it has fueled the sentiments against the indian union at the same time as i have already talked about fractured internal dynamics of pakistan has always troubled the relationship between india and pakistan for example if you are a prime minister in delhi you understand that you have all the power so in india the power is never contested the army is going to follow what the prime minister is going to say and so the political out the, pro, the outcome of a political process is determined is determiner no one can question that however it is very prob problematic for india that it is never able to understand to whom to talk to in pakistan because in pakistan the sovereignty internally is always divided on the face of it often you have a military general who is leading the country as a president so there have been 10 10 years of three phases where presidents have been military generals 
when the military general is not there there is a prime minister to whom that you want to talk to but then as soon as you start talking to prime minister army understands that india and pakistan might come closer and then prime minister might decide to cut down the funds and in order to stall the process of negotiation army then uh, manufactures a terrorist attack then fund starts funding at the same time recently increasing radicalization have created a group of religious leaders who have become very very powerful in pakistan so they have become powerful and they are not only venomous against uh, india they are the ones now calling the shots and this fuel to the religious sentiment was provided by the army to control the political parties now they have gone beyond the hands at the same time there are unresolved boundary disputes so sir creek uh, dispute exists here then the line of control exists here siachen glacier as an issue has always created problem between india and pakistan it's a triangular piece of land as i have already told you it is strategically very very important because if india does not sit here no one is stopping pakistan from pok to directly interact with aksai chin that piece of land prevents the direct interaction in this particular area at the same time it is our access point to central asia correct and so it is important for india to control the Sal saltoro ridge and the siachen glacier also one of the flash points between india and pakistan is the agreement that we signed in 1960s which is the sharing of indus water river so indus uh, water treaty because of its old nature the moment or the year in which it was negotiated it is already now six, all around 70 years 65 years has passed under this particular treaty the negotiation the agreement what india and pakistan had agreed to was that the western rivers and eastern rivers have different claims between india and pakistan so the claims was that let me just change the ink so that you can see so western rivers like indus jhelum and uh, chenab and the entirety of the water belonging to them will go to pakistan whereas eastern rivers like ravi bias and satluj which mainly flow through punjab will belong to india now the problem is that all these six main rivers mainly originate in india so for example indus originates in uh, china tibet but then obviously being an upstream country india always has a strategic advantage they can india can always stop the flow of waters and so it was understood that because the even the western rivers which were allocated to pakistan flow through india india was given minimal use rights to create run of the river projects where you are not going to store any water you can create like if the water level is at 5 to 7 meters you can create a wall of 2 to 3 meters so that a little bit of water gets collected and you can divert that water for agriculture use in last 60 to 70 years a lot of things have changed now we have climate change impacting the flow and distribution of water in india the population density has increased a lot and downstream and upstream uses of water have changed and so in because of the acrimonious relations india and pakistan are not able to renegotiate renegotiate the new indus water treaty and then what this also uh, create problems also there is no data sharing mechanism between india and pakistan because there is no data sharing mechanism between india and pakistan they are never able to communicate to each other and that creates a disaster so very recently pakistan went through floods because we did not have the data to inform them few hours ahead of time that the flow of water uh, has increased and you should be prepared for it so what is the impact or what are the fallouts of india and pakistan not being able to come to the terms uh, come in terms with each other there is a very limited economic integration and far lower trade between india and pakistan so india's trade relation with pakistan follows the cycle of terrorist attack as soon as there is a terrorist attack we understand that government of pakistan might not have they might not be the art artifact of the uh, democratically elected government of pakistan we understand that it is a creation of either the religious leaders or the army but 
in order to respond to the nationalist sentiment in india to the home audience indian government has often uh, devoid of options but to cancel all the trade relations cricket matches stop flow of artists stop and so that is what the problem is because the economic integration between india and pakistan is so low it has stalled the regional integration it has scuttled the process of creating any kind of regional cooperation so any regional cooperation which involves india and pakistan india and pakistan fight so much that it has to be abandoned and so look at what has happened to safta uh, south asian free trade agreement sarc which was a regional cooperation south asian regional cooperation which was created to regionally integrate this region the integration level is so low that for example if let's say uh, india overall trade is 100% uh, let's say 100 rupees india's and pakistan's trade is just 2 rupees on an average whereas the regional trade between asean countries is 50% of their global trade so overall if the 10 members of asean are trading 100 rupees with the globe 50 rupees of that is coming from india indonesia and singapore trade singapore and brunei trade malaysia and thailand trade thailand and so so on and so forth so you can see how deeply integrated asean as a region is and that's why it is so peaceful unless until you remove the political borders and unless until you uh, regionally integrate you will always have troubles uh, also the, because of this acrimony uh, both the countries have all have always been uh, very investment heavy on their defense forces because it is not a threat of any other country except the each other so india upgrades its military uh, uh, paraphernalia mainly to be able to respond to china and pakistan threat in a in a in an ideal world in an imaginary world let's say the relations between india and china and india and pakistan transform to a very very peaceful and healthy relation what we share with let's say bhutan then why do you even need army maybe you need police to take care of law and order maybe you need some central forces maybe you need minimal military but you don't need military we maintain such an intensive defense architecture mainly to be able to respond and that is a vicious cycle India's one rupee investment will force one rupee investment from Pakistan that will again create so it's like a dynamo effect problem is that while both these countries rank very low on human development indicators towards the last 10 or 20 ranking per capita they are they always appear in top 10 in the CIPRI's uh, report which talks about how much each country is investing so when it comes to investment in defense forces we are in top 10 when it comes to the human development indicators we are the bottom countries the bad relations with pakistan hurts our national interests a lot when we wanted to help afghanistan we could not do it because we could not access pakistan land and so in order to reach out to afghanistan we were dependent on iran and Pakistan's geostrategic location is so crucial that Pakistan cannot be ignored by USA, it cannot be ignored by China. And so it always plays the card between US and China because it, Pakistan and Pakistan's deep state very, very clearly understands its geostrategic importance. So access to Central Asia, access to Middle East for India has become so complicated that we have to create uh, India-Middle East corridor where First, the goods will flow through the uh, uh, canal, through the ocean, and then we will transshipment, uh, transship everything to land and then to again ocean. If we had good relations with Pakistan, just a good expressway through Pakistan would have connected us to the hinterland of Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and Middle East. And we ca cannot do that. We have to go through complex processes because we do not share good relation with Pakistan. What is the way forward? First way forward suggested by every diplomat and foreign author, foreign scholars, scholars specializing in diplomacy, talk about back channel diplomacy. Back channel diplomacy basically means a diplomacy which is not directly being driven in a track one or track two forms. So for example, India and Pakistan not directly talking, let's say come in contact with USA, uh, some prominent politician in USA or a diplomat who has worked 
uh, diplomat from Australia who has worked in both India and Pakistan. And through that person, they start communicating. Why it is the only way as of now is because when the governments involve themselves directly in a particular scenario, especially in a, in a case of India and Pakistan, suddenly the limelight shifts and suddenly the focus will be on the governments interacting to, uh, for the peace negotiation, which might backfire because the people in the country on both the sides might not be on the same page. And so it is a good idea to first iron out the finer, finer details devoid of media scrutiny, devoid of public attention. And once those uh, finer details are worked out in secrecy, then maybe we can reveal the whole package slowly and gradually to the government. Obviously, uh, the change in the status of the Jammu Kashmir from a full state to a union territory has not gone, gone down well with uh, China as well as uh, Pakistan because it involves both uh, parties in the dispute. At the same time, in, since 2015 and 16, the Pakistan's funding had suddenly shot up. So what has happened after Burhan Wani, the localization of terror in Kashmir, which was supported and propped up by Pakistan. So unless and until Pakistan roots out, weeds out all the training camps, unless and until it uh, jails all the leaders who openly talk about terror in India, obviously Pakistan cannot expect India to even uh, come on negotiating table. But everything is going to happen hand in hand. So there has to be black back channel diplomacy which should communicate the first precondition normalcy in Kashmir. Then obviously that should be accompanied by some basic minimal level of trade between India and Pakistan. And obviously international help would be needed to finally uh, settle not in the form of mediation but in the form of facilitation the boundary disputes without which it looks impossible obviously everything is going to happen uh, only when you have a democrat democratically elected stable government in pakistan all right so let's now move on quickly to the next article which is about foreign universities so we have seen recently that government has approved the idea that foreign universities can open their campuses in india so maybe pretty soon in 10 to 20 years from now we will not have to go to harvard stanford and oxford to get higher education degrees but rather we will go to the harvard university at delhi or harvard university center at ahmedabad or stanford in mumbai and the same level of education the idea is that once these international institute come to india they are going to provide the same level of research same level of academic atmosphere and so India's research, innovation and higher education will be at par with the global level. Why it is important is because under GS paper 2 you have a line in the syllabus which says issues related to development and management, education, higher education, obviously this is a step in that direction. Let's now quickly cover the pros and challenges which we can see in this particular step. So obviously Quality upgradation is the first thing that you are going to expect when the foreign universities, especially the reputed one, are going to open their campuses in our country because they are going to bring up, bring the state of the art of infrastructure, they are going to bring their own experience faculties, they are going to bring their own experiences along with them, which is basically what we need in India's higher education system. Because India's higher education system has been often criticized that India's university mainly act as education dissemination center pretty well. So if you go to any of the central universities, uh, higher universities, high level like JNU, go to BHU, Anna University, Hyderabad University. When you go to these places, what is assured is that you are going to get a good education. So if you do BA, MA, BA, C, MSc from these places, you are going to get a good education. But this is not the main reason why, why we have higher education institutes. Another reason why we should have them is the purpose of knowledge creation. So Stanford, Harvard, Oxford, uh, Cambridge universities, these are the 
global best globally recognized best institutes not because they give the best teaching but because they are the center of knowledge creation for the first time a new knowledge discovery invention happens mainly in these locations and that's what also the purpose of higher education institutes are at the same time uh, obviously india's higher educational system has been blamed that it does not uh, responds to the changes uh, in the industry is is does not it fails to accommodate the syllabus does not changes very rapidly and so it takes a lot of time for india's education system to respond to the global changes once these global universities will come the curriculum that we will develop in our country will be uh, concomitant with what is going on globally and will be in a better situation to respond to the industry needs so obviously it is going to reduce the need for foreign exchange obviously because if a student let's say a person a goes to either usa or uk or australia the money is sent by the family in most cases because most of the uh, higher education is not funded by the university they, they are not in the form of scholarships and fellowships so most of the people fund their education when they fund their education the families have to expend spend that money in the foreign country so that is like uh, a loss to the indian economy and so if the same education can be uh, obtained here within the territory of india it is going to boost our economy also and at the same time as i have talked about it is going to boost the research because these educational institutes are known for their research and it is going to boost the cultural exchange between the countries because if they will set up their uh, campuses in india they are going to send their own people who will bring along with them their culture the problem is affordability because the ugc regulations have allowed them to set up their own fees and there is no regulation on them so most likely these are going to be very expensive so what will happen in a scenario where you have a lot of university campuses in india uh, good education probably the world's best education probably will come to why i'm using the word probably probably the world's best education but accessible by only the cream of the cream and so you can see that it is like an injustice the poor people in india will not be able to access what the rich people in india are able to access and that is of concern but you can always say that it is a private entrepreneurship even while going abroad poor people are not able to access the education given by if you have to pay for it that's correct but if you are bringing those campuses in india can there be a mechanism where you allow even the poor people to uh, get obviously they are not going to get even a single penny from the government of india now the government of india funds research government of india funds uh, various kinds of uh, activities it basically supports all the expenditure of the public university the question that a lot of scholars have raised that in absence of the government funding which is massive even if they open the campus the foreign universities whether they will uh, be interested in that kind of a scenario where in a market you cannot meet the expenses done by the central government because central government funds are massive and so the questions that are raised is that whether they are going to open full fledged campuses and make them unsustainable or they will open very small campuses offering very few selected catering to the needs of very few people and so that is like an institute running in a one building and not opening up their main research labs here because they will not be able to compete with the indian labs funded by the central government at the same time while it is understood that only few universities will be allowed to open their campuses in india on the basis of rankings that we are not going to allow any any uh, foreign university to set up their campus in india it has to be first good in their own country it has to be globally recognized problem is that there are so many rankings <coughs> to determine uh, to determine the status of a particular university or which is the ranking on which the government of india is going to rely upon in order uh, to allow a particular because there are so many rankings and depending upon one ranking to another the ranks of particular universities change and also it is not uh, it is not going to provide a level playing field because in india private higher education institutions 
have to first register themselves as non for profit organization so if i want to set up a university in india in a private sense like an amity university like a vit vellore institute of technology if i want to set them first i'll have to register it as a non for profit which means that i can generate profit through that process but then i cannot take the benefit the profit has to be reinvested in the same business while the foreign institutes that have been allowed to open campuses in india they there is no such obligations for them and so they can act for profit like a sheer business enterprise once they develop the profit they can take the profit away from india and they can uh, ship the profit back to their parent country also and so the obvious question is that if you allow that to do uh, if you allow them to do this it's almost the same thing as indian people going abroad and ex uh, spending the foreign exchange reserve and so there is still a lot of debate about whether india should go ahead with this particular initiative and whether really we are going to gain anything from it but what is clear going forward is that india's higher education commission or higher education commission of india should come up with its own standards with its own rankings just the way uh, nirf has done for indian universities and on the basis of those rankings each and every individual uh, countries and their universities should be ranked and indian government should rely only on those rankings all right at the same time it is important for them to be forced into working as a non for profit only then india's private higher education institutions and foreign private higher education institutions will have a leveling, level playing field so these are the two things that you can easily resolve other aspects of affordability and these are the debates which go on even with india's private higher education institutions let's now move on to the last part of the discussion which is about the editorial summary we have three editorials to be summarized for you first one very important how women can be represented in politics so recently we have seen that 106th constitutional amendment has been passed correct which has given assured reservation to women in legislative assemblies and in lok sabha not in rajya sabha fine and one of the arguments that has been given traditionally against any such step to give reservation against reservation is that look we have provided assured reservation to women even at the local level that was done in uh, through 73rd and 74th constitutional amendment now we have the advantage of hindsight we have seen the reservation working for 30 years now and we have seen that it has not really led to any significant kind of women empowerment because still on the ground the shots are called by the husbands of the sarpanch if the sarpanch is women and so one of the drawbacks that we have also discussed in dns is that if you really want women empowerment you should talk about reservation within political parties because that is what is permanent if political parties incorporate more and more number of women or it becomes obligatory on them to incorporate more and more women obviously it is going to result in more number of women politicians parliamentarians and legislative assembly members legislators what the authors are giving a counter to this argument and they have done it beautifully with the help of statistics so they have analyzed the recent decision uh, recent election results in rajasthan and what they have said is that in there is a statistics to show that uh, whenever a women was posed against a men so for example let me just if a women was made a candidate either by main party because in uh, rajasthan the main contest is between bjp and congress because they alter between there is no third party like in up or samajwadi party baspa there is no regional party and so whenever uh, strong parties like bjp and congress put their women candidate against each other bjp and congress statistically significant more number of men have come out as winners because of their high winability because they dominate the public discourse at the same time what they said that leave a leave aside this uh, whenever both the both the parties 
put their own candidate as women. So let's say there is a constituency where the BJP candidate is also women. There is a Congress candidate who is also a woman. So in Rajasthan, you would expect either BJP women or the women candidate of Congress to win the election. What they say is that in most number of such cases where both BJP and Congress put their main candidates, as, their candidate as women, there is a third independent candidate who was male has won the seats, which shows that their the patriarchal mindset of the society leads the society or the voters the perception of the people leads them to vote preferentially to the male members of the society and so what they say that if you do not come up with 106th constitutional amendment like uh, mechanism and if you just ensure political representation within parties it is not going to lead any significant change into political empowerment because our society has such a mindset that if not forced they are never going to vote for women and look at what we have found through research. When there were two women candidates from BJP and Congress, in most number of cases, the male from the independent party has won the candidate. And what they say is that in this case, if either one of them from BJP or Congress was male, the likelihood of them winning would be much higher. And that's what the problem and that's why they say that this is a step in the right direction. India and UAE are coming closer. They are coming closer. This article basically summarizes the indications the manifestations of india and uae coming together how it is being manifested is the for example uae president donates a land where the baps akshardham is coming up with the first temple in the entire middle east and that land was donated by the president at the same time mr narendra modi has been invited as a chief guest into the world government uh, conclave and he has been invited as a president, by, uh, as, a, as a chief guest by the president of UAE himself. At the same time, Modi and UAE president share a very, very good personal relation. And this personal relation is what is driving, has become one of the main uh, factor which is bringing these two countries together. At the same time, a uh, comprehensive economic partnership agreement was finalized between the two countries in record time. The minimum number of years that it took for India to finalize SEPA with any other country, the shortest has been UAE. At the same time, you can see that we are a part of U I2U2. At the same time, both are a part of Indian Middle East corridor. Rupee card is now acceptable in the UAE. So you can just swipe Rupee uh, in UAE that was enabled through the personal. So in, there's a lot of convergence they are coming together and that is a very very good thing that's why the title is partnership without a gulf so although it is situated in the gulf there is no gulf between india and uae last article for today's discussion is india as a net security provider where mr raja menon uh, who is a formal navy admiral what he talks about is that look at the recent incidents that have happened the, the recent incidents that have happened in Swiss, near Suez Canal, Red Sea, the Israel-Palestine conflict and the resurgence of Houthi rebellion and the attack that happened on India's ship. Uh, obviously, the recent incidents have made the shipping through this particular route extremely costly. So first, no one is ready to take the ship. Even if there is a carrier who says that, okay, I'll take the risk, every shipping has to be insured and the insurance cost has gone so up that most of the carriers are preferring to go south, circle the entire Africa and then go to Europe. At the same time, India's response have been very defensive. So what he says is that India has not come out in an offensive manner. India's response has been very, very defensive. And what he says is that if India really wants to act as a regional power, it has to act as a net security provider. So, in order to act as a net security provider, what you should be first able to demonstrate is military diplomacy. So, for example, you should have enough money to donate, give and make them use uh, military platforms, equipments. You should be able to negotiate agreements with the regional countries. So, if you have that, let's say in the lateral countries of Red Sea, then maybe 
they will themselves be able to take care of such kinds of incidents because of the help from india apart from that you should be ready to give military assistance which is active military intervention in the time of need so let's say a country like jibouti now it has a chinese station over there but generally for example if there is none then india should have the heft and the guts to say that now we are coming with our own air, indian uh, aircraft carrier you know don't worry we will be stationed there to defend any kind of threat at the same time uh, not only india should contribute uh, to the empowerment of local militaries india should be able to assist them to develop their own skills so it is just not sufficient to give them helicopter or to attack helicopters to give them uh, like a corvette it is also important to make them learn how to use it effectively and that is the part where india has been missing so what the author says is that only part where india has been very good is human assistance and disaster relief hadr act activities for which india has a garnered very very good sentiments has built up good relations uh, among these regional countries so this is what uh, is that main take away from this particular editorial again i will repeat the same point the time that we are going to continue from tomorrow is again going to be six there was some exceptional situation we have to go to jatin sir's marriage and that's why we had to do it today early tomorrow Sharp at six, we'll come live with three newspaper: the Hindu, Indian Express, and let me know in the chat box what is the third newspaper that we have started covering. Also on Sunday. All right. So if you like our initiative, please press the like button. All right. Good night.